Okay, hello everybody and welcome to our first ever Bayer Fellows Foundation Symposium. I'm really excited to see everyone here. Um, it took a lot of people working together to get to this point. Um, I am not Kim Sampson and Carl Collins, I'm just Kim. Uh, Carl is uh, at the hospital with his wife is about to have a baby uh, early. So um, he shared with me his slides last night for the Bayer Foundation. So bear with me, I'm gonna just wing it. Um, I run our fellows program and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a few minutes. And first I'll share about the foundation. I can't answer any questions. There's some contact information about that and there's a few people in the audience who can uh, help out with the foundation questions if they're here. Uh, but the vision for Bayer's foundation is, of course, for, as for all of Bayer, health for all, hunger for none. Uh, the, the Bayer Foundation is Bayer's philanthropic uh, branch for the company. And they really want to catalyze advances in science and social in innovation uh, outside of Bayer. And they want to do this in order to enhance the impact of science as the basis for science uh, for societal pro um, progression. And there's three points, equity in science, collaboration in science, and trust in science. And these are the three pillars that the foundation has for their activities. And all of it under the umbrella of health for all, hunger for none. And then there's three parts of the, um, the programs for the Bayer Foundation trust in science, and there they have various programs for STEM education and societal progression, uh, equity in science for things like gender equality, and then the third pillar is collaboration in science, and that is where we are, uh, and for that, for, this, for the Bayer Foundation Science Network, they have various scientific awards, fellowships, symposium lecture, and here is the first symposium, uh, Boundary Breaking Science. And they have other things like these lectures. They uh, recently had uh, Boundary Breaking Science lectures where they bring in uh, the top like Nobel Prize winning and top scientists, and all of the, uh, all of the um, talks that they have are all recorded for public access because that's one of the things they want to be able to share the science with everybody, not just within Bayer. And they also recently had a workshop of young, top young academics in collaboration with Bayer scientists, where they brought everybody together for a full day workshop um, just recently this year. And then here, as I was saying, this is our first symposium. So they have the lectures, workshops, and now symposium, all under the umbrella of boundary-breaking science. So our talk today is from gene editing to gene writing, and it's a collaboration with the Bayer Foundation, the Bayer Science Fellows, and also support from the Bayer Life Science Collaboration Program and the new Life Hub here in Monheim. And so if you have more, would like more information about the foundation, here's all the contact information. Uh, you can always find it on LinkedIn. There's a couple of people, if you want to raise your hands, who might be able to help Anik. There's Anik and Laura. Yeah, Laura, okay. They can maybe help find, find more information. And then the, uh, the organizers, though, for this, meeting for this symposium are the Bayer Science Fellows. And the Bayer Science Fellows, a lot of you, hopefully in the audience, are Bayer Science Fellows, but this is a program within Bayer for Bayer Fellows where we really want to leverage the science and scientists across all of Bayer, across all of the divisions, crop science, pharmaceuticals, and consumer health. And what the Fellows Program is, is it's an, a community of our top expert scientists at Bayer where we really want to um, 
leverage our scientists and help them with recognition for their scientific excellence, increase their visibility across Bayer, maximize their science potential, and all to help Bayer um, improve the scientific culture at Bayer, helped attract and recruit and maintain our top scientists, and improve the reputation and recognition of Bayer altogether. So this is a, a, a sort of a newish program at Bayer, and this is our first symposium here, and it's really exciting to be partnering with the foundation for this. And so um, it's first, this is hopefully the first in a series of symposium, depends on how it goes, um, but we hope that this will become a, a series for the fellows and foundation to do together. And without further ado, here's our agenda for the day. And first, in uh, this great lineup, we will have Florian, who will give a little intro on the technology to help ground everybody for all of the upcoming talks for the day. And so, Florian, would you like to come up? Yeah, thanks, Kim, for the nice introduction, uh, and uh, best of luck to Carl. Um, so yeah, I'm Florian, I'm a Bioscience Fellow. I uh, feel privileged to be able to give you a quick introduction to the technology and set the stage for the uh, uh, group of distinguished speakers that we'll be presenting throughout the day. Uh, this is, yeah, that's how you move on, perfect. That's the laser pointer, oops, nope. That's the laser pointer, perfect. Uh, so um, I'll try to give a very brief introduction to the technology of gene editing, mostly based on uh, CRISPR-Cas. Uh, talk, try to talk about the applications in human health and also the applications in agriculture. Um, I would assume a lot of people in the audience are already familiar with uh, sort of the basic properties of, of CRISPR-Cas or Cas9, um, but, but there's also probably a few people in the audience um, who are not actively working in the field. Um, and so I wanted to give a very basic intro to Cas9. So what is, everyone has probably heard the term Cas9 by now. Uh, what is Cas9? From a very simple standpoint, Cas9 is a protein that binds a guide RNA, uh, and if that protein bound to a guide RNA happens to encounter a DNA uh, that has the same sequence as a part of the guide RNA, the DNA gets cleaved into. So simple as that. Um, so in one sentence, Cas9 is an RNA programmable nuclease. Um, there's also a video running up here, so this was a paper that came out a few years ago of single molecule spectroscopy where you can actually see Cas9 sitting on the DNA and then uh, after some time cleaving it. Um, the good thing is that the uh, programmability is relatively specific, so any location in the genome can be easily targeted by uh, simply providing the right guide RNA and um, I mean usually that works quite well. Um, and usually, ideally, only that one location that is being specified by the guide RNA is then being targeted. Um, Cas9 is not the first nuclease that can be programmed to, um, or the first type of protein that can be programmed to cleave uh, different, um, different locations in the genome. Um, but what sets it apart is that the program programmability is really trivial, right? So you can always use the same protein uh, and just combine it with different guide RNAs. Uh, whereas previous nuclease technologies, you would always have to uh, make some tweaks to the protein. Um, so, why did Nature think it was necessary to come up with, with a remarkable system like that? Um, one slide about the sort of biological background and evolutionary history of Cas9. Um, so, we all know that before humans, there were, the Earth was inhabited by bacteria for hundreds of millions of years, and these bacteria uh, are also being targeted by viruses and have to defend themselves against viruses. Um, and in the course of evolution, this adaptive immune system that, uh, that's called CRISPR-Cas um, essentially came into being um, where um, certain bacteria, when they get invi invaded by a virus for the first time or by a phage, and the phage will infect its genetic material into the DNA, uh, then this genetic material of the phage gets cut up into different snippets, and uh, yeah, these different small pieces of the phage genome then get saved in the bacterial genome, uh, where the, uh, this genetic information then is transcribed again, and that's how you get the natural guide RNAs. Uh, and these natural guide RNAs then associate with the Cas9 that is floating around, or other Cas nucleases, 
And um, then the next time the virus comes along, it's essentially being chopped, chopped up right away, and, and, um, and yeah, the bacteria knows how to defend itself. And I think for, I mean, so that humans have, a, have an adaptive immune system has been known for about, I don't know, hundreds, probably 100 years or something. Uh, the fact that bacteria also have an adaptive immune system uh, was only discovered relatively recent, so in the maybe last 20 or 30 years. And yeah, so the way I like to see it is that often this, these CRISPR-Cas systems are the product of a molecular arms race between bacteria and, uh, and, and the viruses that invade them. And this arms race has been going on for many, many millions of years. And because there's this ever ongoing contest between bacteria who try to defend themselves against viruses or, and, and these, the viruses that try to infect bacteria, um, this uh, CRISPR-Cas evolution has produced several different types of these programmable nucleases. Um, the most famous one of them is um, Cas9, which, oops, excuse me, um, which was discovered in 2009 or first sort of described in its molecular properties in, in 2000 and, and 2012, uh, and that made it possible to be applied in many different um, in many different application contexts. Um, but since this, what I sometimes like to call the Big Bang of CRISPR-Cas, uh, since Cas9 uh, was discovered and described in 2012, people sort of know what to look for. And in the years past, um, a bunch of more nucleases that essentially have the same property uh, have also been discovered uh, by mining bacterial genomes. Um, these nucleases differ in, several, differ in several properties that make them useful for certain types of applications or, or others. Uh, so there's a remarkable range in sizes. So the original Cas9 is a rather clunky, I mean, rather big problem with about 1,200 amino acids or 1,300 amino acids. Um, but uh, as of a few years ago, and uh, Lucas Harrington, who will go after me, um, will probably um, tell, um, talk, uh, present more details about that. Uh, we know there's also very small and compact nucleases that essentially can do the same task and only 450 amino acids. Um, yeah, there's also different, a few different biochemical differences, but I won't go into these for now. Um, so, why is this property of programmable cleavage actually useful, right? I mean, how does DNA cleavage lead to a therapeutic or, or any phenotypic effect that we would like to see when, when we use these molecules for application? Um, so, usually after cleavage, so this is uh, supposed to be the cleaved DNA here, um, uh, different DNA repair pathways can get activated. That sort of depends on what cell type you're acting in or, or what part of the cell cycle the cell is, is currently uh, busy with. What uh, happens most typically is this non-homologous end joining or NHEJ pathway where the uh, lesion or the double strand break in the DNA um, gets resected on both, both sides of, of on both strands uh, and then gets uh, glued together again uh, with a few uh, different, yeah, w w with a few minor differences like some, a few insertions and deletions and you get what is called an indel. Uh, and since this indel is usually not perfect, um, but usually you're in, yeah, inserting a or deleting a couple of places, it commonly leads to frame shift mutations. Um, and so if, uh, if the double strand break was in the coding sequence of a gene, then usually you get a gene disruption. Uh, another thing that could happen, which from an application standpoint sometimes is more, even more interesting, is if you provide donor DNA, either a yeah, linear or like, I mean, linearized template, um, then you can actually uh, think, start to think about uh, gene corrections or additions where um, the cell will essentially take the donor DNA uh, and put this donor DNA in, into the double strand break. Uh, there's two mechanisms by which that can happen. Uh, number one is this homology independent targeted integration, um, which doesn't have high efficiencies, but, but works in every cell type or in most cell types, um, at least as far as I know. Uh, and the other, in some ways, even more useful thing that could happen is um, homology directed repair, um, where if you provide a donor template that has homology to the site that was cleaved, you actually get essentially a perfect, um, yeah, almost a perfect repair situation where the donor DNA is, putting, is being put into the target DNA in exactly the way you want it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is sort of cell type dependent and yeah, only, only happens, or only happens in, uh, in dividing cells, so you, you can't use it for, um, uh, for, for any scenario. Um, Lastly, so this is sort of my last introduction slide. Since Cas9 was discovered, into, so in the um, initial paper when Cas9 was sort of described as this programmable nucleus, um, it became clear that uh, it has actually two active sites that perform the cleavage on the DNA strands. And by making very simple point mutations, you can deactivate these two, um, two nuclear sites. 
uh, and then you get a protein that can still bind RNA and can also still bind DNA. So essentially, um, yeah, you have a programmable DNA binding complex. Uh, and then from that inside, it was a very short, uh, just a very short step to also realize that you can make various fusion proteins uh, where you add various DNA modifying enzymes, add them to this dead Cas9, uh, and then this dead Cas9 is essentially a platform for, for various next generation genomics applications. Uh, and I know this sort of Swiss army knife analogy is somewhat tired, um, but still I think it, it, it applies in this part because, um, I mean, by now uh, there's examples for all of these sort of different functionalities being realized with, with dead Cas9, so you can um, uh, fuse transcriptional activators or deactivators to dead Cas9 and then you can, without cleaving the DNA, can activate or deactivate certain genes. Uh, you can also um, fuse deaminases, uh, which are types of enzymes that um, change the identity of a certain base um, to DCAS9 and then um, the, uh, in a technology called base editing you can add specific point mutations to the genome without cleaving, cleaving the DNA um, yeah, and also a few others and so yeah so DCAS, DCAS9 or other DCAS proteins are really a platform for engineering next generation uh, applications. Um, with that I'd like to briefly talk about applications in human health or pharma. Um, so first of all, when you think about of how to use CAS or programmable nucleases as therapeutics, um, there's a broad distinction between two different approaches, uh, which are called the ex vivo editing and the in vivo uh, editing approach. In the ex vivo editing approach, you first take oops, excuse me, uh, you first take cells from the patient, uh, then in a petri dish in the lab, uh, edit these cells and uh, once you've edited the cells and once you have controlled that everything looks the way it should, um, you can essentially graft them, uh, inject them back into the patient where they then hopefully sort of engraft themselves, propagate and, and cause a therapeutic effect. Um, in the in vivo approach, um, you essentially, um, you don't take cells from the patient but you inject the Cas nucleus either as, um, uh, as, as, as a DNA with, with, with sort of a tamed virus or as, a, as mRNA uh, in an LNP contact, but essentially you inject the nucleus uh, straight into the patient, uh, and then the nucleus will sort of find its way, hopefully find its way, to the desired target tissue and there perform a therapeutic edit. Um, and there's lots of advantages and disadvantages about these two, about these two different approaches. Um, maybe trying to sort of synthesize them down to one or two sentences is that, of course, in ex vivo approaches, uh, you have a lot better control over the editing outcome, right, because you can check your cells before you give them back to the patient. Um, but, however, you're limited to indications where you can isolate the target tissue uh, and where also the edited cells can propagate and, and sort of multiply once they're back in the body. Um, whereas the in vivo approaches, you can also essentially, in theory, could target tissues that don't propagate anymore. Um, but, of course, you are sort of uh, reliant on delivery technology for the tissue um, that you need to reach. Um, and with in vivo approaches, of course, the, ri the risk-benefit balance also needs to be checked even more than for the ex vivo approaches, right? Because you want to make sure that the nucleus doesn't do anything that it's not supposed to do. Um, so here's an overview that uh, some that I didn't prepare myself, but uh, some colleagues from our cell and gene therapy division prepared. Um, so as mentioned, Cas9 was only described or, or properly described uh, in 2012, and so it's only been 10 years. But in these only 10 years, uh, by now, already more than 40 clinical trials based on this CRISPR-Cas technology uh, have been started in various different, uh, various different indication spaces. Um, and I'd say that's, that's really like a testament and a proof of the versatility of this technology because the competing technologies that weren't as easily programmable have been around for much longer and uh, we certainly don't see this uh, quick adaptation in, in, in the actual, in actual pharmaceutical app applications. Um, what's also sort of interesting or like, I mean, notable is that uh, in these, I, I'd say we're still in the early days of CRISPR-Cas based uh, therapies uh, and so far the ex vivo approaches uh, yeah, seem to be dominating. So the uh, blue phases or the blue dots represent clinical trials where an in vivo approach is, is, um, uh, is employed and the black dots uh, represent ex vivo approaches. Now, um, who is doing all these clinical trials? So if you uh, look at the landscape of, of, of companies um, that try to translate this technology into clinical, um, um, into clinical benefit, um, the interesting thing is that um, you will see that there's 
relatively young biotechnology companies that have developed the different nucleus technologies. So on the top of, oops, excuse me, on the top of the slide, I've uh, shown all the sort of major nucleus types again that exist so far, at least according to our interpretation, um, that were discovered starting in 2012 and up to 2020. Uh, and usually these nucleus technologies are being developed by these relatively young biotech companies that I've, that I've drawn here under the respective nucleus. Um, and then you have the more established, bigger uh, pharma companies um, that uh, make collaborations um, with, these, um, with, these, with these biotech companies. Um, and usually the biotech companies um, will sort of um, share their uh, expertise in, in using the technology, while the more established pharma companies will, um, will bring in their expertise in certain indication spaces. And I'd also like to spotlight uh, one a clinical program that is already somewhat advanced and uh, so far is very promising, uh, which is called uh, NTLA-201 um, by Intellia Therapeutics, which, is, which was one of the first, um, first of these biotech companies to, uh, to use Cas9 for clinical applications. So there's a disease that's called hereditary ATTR, um, which is autosomal dominant. So if you have only one allele that has, um, that has a pathogenic mutation, you're likely to get the disease. Uh, and about 120 of these uh, pathogenic mutations are known. Uh, what usually happens if you have one of these in, in people that have one of these pathogenic mutations is that this transthyretin protein uh, tends to misfold and then aggregate, and then you get accumulations of these misfolded aggregates in the nerves in the heart um, with, um, yeah, um, a disadvantage, uh, like an unfortunate clinical outcome. Um, then, now, one approach that was realized to be um, to potentially be um, be useful uh, to get at this disease is to simply knock out the gene uh, so to simply uh, program a Cas9 with a guide RNA that cleaves somewhere in the gene and then knocks out the gene and then you don't get these aggregates um, and it's apparently good enough if you knock out this gene in liver tissue because liver tissue and liver tissue can be easily targeted um, and by using this approach, so far the clinical trial has been going on for a few years, up to 74 uh, participants in, uh, in, in so, uh, so far a phase one study, uh, where right now the readout is just the reductions in, uh, in the uh, PTR levels in the serum. Uh, and the most recent interim outcome that was posted, this was a few months ago that Intelia posted this, was for 12 patients. Uh, you had a minimal TTR reduction, or you had a TTR reduction of at least 90%, so this is not average, but at least 90%. Um, with an encouraging safety profile and also exceeding the current standard of care, where actually the current standard of care is a small interfering RNA uh, that also knocks out the protein, but it doesn't knock it out, but knocks it down. You have to take it every three weeks, though. Uh, and so uh, TTR reduction levels with this gene therapy approach are higher, and it's a one-and-done approach, so it likely has benefits versus the existing standard of care. Okay, I'd also, since this is a Bayer Symposium, I'd also highlight uh, the activities that Bayer Pharma has been doing in this uh, space. So actually in 2015, Bayer and um, another of these early biotechnology startups uh, had a col collaboration um, uh, and formed a JV called Casiba Therapeutics together. And as part of that collaboration, um, a, a small team in the Bayer Protein Engineering Division uh, spent a couple of years developing uh, smaller nucleases, um, yeah, smaller versions of Cas9. Uh, this ended up, uh, or we ended up presenting that at, at a f excuse me, at a few conferences. Uh, also had uh, a paper about a year ago, and uh, more recently, Bayer and uh, uh, Mammoth Biosciences, which is uh, another biotechnology startup uh, that's developing Cas nucleus technology, entered into um, a collaboration to um, yeah to develop genome editing technologies for a few in for a few indications. Uh, Lucas Harrington, uh, who co-founded uh, Mammoth, is. Uh, speaking after me, and we'll probably uh, share more details about that. Uh, with that, am I doing okay on time, I guess? Okay, it should be fine, yeah, well, three slides left. Uh, I'm also in the pharma division, so I can't say as much about agriculture, but uh, thanks, Larry, for helping me out. So I want to share a few slides about the applications in agriculture. Um, so the one of the... Oh, there's actually animations, okay, good. Um, so one of the long-standing goals in, in agriculture is to increase productivity of plants, right, which would translate to less land use. And this is actually an experiment that uh, Bayer, I think, did, um, did at some point, where they essentially cultivated um, different plots of land with cultivation techniques that uh, were happened in the 1940s 
and then at different, uh, different stages up until now. And we see that there's this constant improvement um, in, in, in crop productivity, which translates to, um, to a reduction in the land that is necessary to, to obtain the same amount of food. Um, the big step here, like, so, so I asked Larry what this huge step was from 1940 to 1980, uh, and that was actually the introduction of nitrogen fertilizer, um, but still there's more and more innovations, and so we're sort of, uh, we keep pushing the edge here, and, and we expect that genome editing um, will, will help us in sort of further reducing this. Um, uh, so what is BioCrop Science interested in using gene technology uh, for? Uh, basically, this, our interest here can be divided into three areas. Uh, disease resistance. Uh, examples for genome editing ap applications to disease resistance would, could be um, modifying a receptor where a pathogen docks so that the pa pathogen cannot dock anymore. Um, and I already talked about, I'll give an example for crop productivity. Um, and yeah, there's also certain factors about grain quality that can be improved. Um, about the crop productivity, I'd also like the, to take the opportunity to highlight one particular product that Bayer has been, um, uh, two particular products that Bayer has been working on. Um, first of all, we've used uh, gene editing um, to uh, produce a corn plant that is actually shorter while still uh, producing the same amount of, of corn or producing the same amount of yield. Uh, and this uh, shorter corn plant um, is just much better handleable in the field, so it doesn't tip over as much. Um, and yeah, also it gives okay yield. Another thing um, that we're working on, and this is in collaboration with another small startup that's called Pairwise, uh, where we have a, long, a very close collaboration with, is to develop a corn plant um, uh, that has an increased number of kernel rows. So in a natural or uh, uh, one of these older varieties of corn, uh, so you usually have up to sort of 16 kernel rows, right? So you essentially have yeah, 16 corn kernels. And uh, in these edited varieties that we, we are developing in collaboration with Pairwise, you're seeing up to 20 or 24 um, kernel rows. And so again, this is a nice productivity trait. Um, then this is my last slide, I think. Um, and like in, like in the pharma space, in the uh, agriculture space, uh, since the discovery of uh, CRISPR-Cas, there's also been this sort of, well, yeah, I, I guess I can use the term explosion, this explosion of, of, of different programs uh, with different players, not just the big companies, but also smaller companies, uh, trying to use the technology to, um, to edit for various, various improved traits. Um, actually, the first uh, example on this slide, apparently, at least uh, according to Larry, uh, wasn't done with CRISPR-Cas9, but all the others are. So here we can also see how CRISPR-Cas uh, because of its trivial programmability, it's sort of outcompeting all the other approaches. Um, and yeah, I'd also like to uh, highlight uh, this particular program. So Katie Martin uh, is in the audience and will be uh, presenting details about this program. And with that, I will pass it on to Lucas. Ah, to Anke, sorry, yeah, Anke is introducing Lucas.